we already have laws limiting the use of mandatory overtime for various health care providers here in New York State. It's designed to improve the quality of care, patient safety, and the safety of workers. There are exemptions on mandatory overtime when there are emergencies like the COVID pandemic. But mandatory overtime is back with a vengeance, and it's reaching a crisis level in many of our hospitals. And the pressure is on. Now add to that, I'm tired. I haven't gone to the bathroom. I haven't had a drink. My blood sugar is probably low. Am I thinking correctly? And now I've been mandated to stay longer. On this podcast, we'll hear from nurses and their unions on why it's so important to strengthen mandatory overtime laws. Lisa Cosma is joining us now on the podcast, and Lisa is a registered nurse at a hospital here in New York State. Lisa, thank you for joining us on the Union Strong podcast. Thank you so much for having me. How long have you been a nurse? I've been a registered nurse for 36 years. And did you work throughout the COVID pandemic? I did work throughout the pandemic. It was a very difficult time in the lives of all healthcare workers, especially the nurses. It certainly was. And we thank you for all the kind of work you do already. But I just can't even imagine throughout COVID. And and just we owe you so much gratitude for that. So um, now it's after COVID. And we're hearing that the mandatory overtime issue is still a serious problem in our hospitals. And I think for some people, they maybe that they would think since we're over the hump, hopefully with COVID, that things have gotten better. But that's not the case. What is the problem right now? Is it is it it's a staffing issue that's leading to the mandatory overtime? Is that what's happening? It is a staffing issue. Um, so we have lost nurses um, to COVID burnout. Um, we have lost nurses to the mandate. Um, they've chosen to either leave the bedside altogether or they've actually come to travel, um, whichever one it is. And that is because of... Um, literally burnout, um, how we're treated now. Um, When you go from being really important to being not so important or being treated poorly, you don't wanna stay there, regardless of of your loyalty to the institution or to your community. Um, There are pre-existing holes in the schedule as far as across the spectrum. We've lost nurses in many departments. Um, My home department, which is the recovery area, we've lost nurses um, because of other reasons and this reason as well, the COVID, um, and they've chosen to do other things. So we have holes in our schedule on a regular basis. No one's mandated for them, but they're asking us to voluntarily sign up for these holes. So we could have four or five empty slots just on a regular day. Then there's call, which specialty departments such as myself take call. And there are holes in the call schedule because there are nurses who are also leaving the operating room. So there are nurses in my OR who are getting mandated for call when they're not even obligated for call for that day. So I could be sitting home, it's my day off, and I get a text message and it says, you're mandated tonight to come in in in-house, or you're mandated to be from second call to first call. And anybody that's a nurse that's listening to this will completely understand what I'm saying. So now here you are, not only working your regular hours, but sometimes you're now working over and above it because of these pre-existing holes. And they cannot continue to staff off of us for pre-existing holes. They need to hire staff. Um, We do have some travelers, but travelers do not notoriously take call. They get specific shifts. And you can't just count on travelers. Travelers are making a lot of money. Why aren't they paying us this money? So traveling nurses go from hospital to hospital as needed, and they can get top dollar because of that, right? Top dollar. They make more than I do um, because there's different stipends involved. There's different monies involved. So the money that they make, and I don't know what they salary make, but what I do is their baseline money is less than what the travel company is really charging. So there's the travel company making money, and then the nurses making extra money, food money, travel money, gas money, um, lodging, all of those things. And if you live locally and you travel locally, you can pocket that money because you're living in your own house, but you're still getting a stipend for for housing. Right. So the idea would be instead of spending that money that way, 
you would spend it on staff who are going to be there at the hospital. So there wouldn't be that need to hire the traveling nurse. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't know if the recruitment is out there as much as what it is, uh, as what it should be, I should say. Um, But you can't continue to staff off of the people that are there and not expect them to be tired. You know, this is why the laws for mandation came into effect because of staff burnout. So let's just do staff burnout and then let's put some COVID onto it. And then we have upticks at numbers and the numbers are apparently climbing a little bit more in New York state again. So, you know, you put all of those things together and you have nurse fatigue. We make mis- we could make mistakes. Um, things can happen. You're tired. Now tonight I happen to be on call from um, midnight to eight in the morning, but that was because that's what I chose to do. So I will take a little sleep and get a little nap, but let's just say that I work tonight from 11 to 11 and I expected to go home and now I'm mandated for call until seven the next morning. So that's another eight hours on top of a 12 hour shift, which is against your mandatory law of 16 hours. So that can happen as well. And what does that mean when you are told you're being mandated? What if you say no, what happens? So if you're already there, That's actually considered patient abandonment because you have patients you have to take care of. And nurses, because we have a license, we are held accountable for those things. So if we were to walk out, so let me, let's say I'm in a room and I'm doing a case and there's no one there to relieve me and there's no one there to come in after me. That patient is my responsibility. I cannot walk out. I cannot go to the time clock. I cannot punch out and go home. And it's stressful work and you're on your feet and you're making life and death choices sometimes, right? There is a lot of pressure. Um, It's a pressure of, was I tired? Did I pull the right med out of the right drawer? Did I read that blood pressure right? Um, Can I get a hold of the doctor because that blood pressure is too low? Um, Can I get another nurse to help me hook this presser up on a pump so that we know and verify that I hooked it up correctly so that I don't overdose my patient on a presser or a morphine pump. You know, the emotional stress of just making sure that you don't make a mistake or that you didn't miss something in an assessment or in a, or even in a patient statement. It's the listening to them. It's the watching them. And the pressure is on. Now add to that, I'm tired. I haven't gone to the bathroom. I haven't had a drink. My blood sugar is probably low. Am I thinking correctly? And now I've been mandated to stay longer. What what could I potentially do? And that is something that we all worry about on a regular basis. I have coworkers that are truly concerned about what is happening. And some of them are new nurses who've been in the field a very relatively short period of time who are now rethinking their career choices. And that is such a disservice to those of us because we don't want this system to fail. I don't want some robotic nurse to come in and take care of my people. I want someone who's dedicated, who's willing to look at the community for what it is. I don't want them to leave. I count on the new nurses to like, when you train them, you pass on a skill set that was given to you. And you want to pay it forward every time. So when you train someone, you want them to like be that same person. A little different because they'll always have their own flair, but it's like being the last of the Mohicans. If that makes any sense to you, you want to always pay it forward because that's just something that you you take pride in. You take pride in the fact that you gave something to a baby nurse the way that it was given to me and you watch them blossom. And now I'm watching them not blossom. And now I'm watching them fail because they feel that they can't do it anymore because they're not appreciated, because they're not respected, because they're not treated as the professionals that we are. And that's exactly how we're being treated now is that we are not the professionals that we deserve to be treated as. And that is egregious, truly. Well, Lisa, we can see your passion coming through. We can hear the passion. Obviously, this is a career that you cherish. You've done it for a long time. And we need your experience um, and that that drive that that you bring to the profession. 
So um, we're doing everything we can at the state fed to make this happen. Um, you've got a lot of people on your side, and we hope that people watching this and hearing this will get on board to push this to get these bills passed as well. But I just want to thank you for everything you do, and thank you for your time and coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, and thank you for letting it be heard, because I really want the word to be out there. Okay, joining me on the podcast is Allison Salado, who's an RN. Allison, thank you for joining me on the program. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Tell me a little bit about what the conditions are like right now uh, where you work. The conditions, the staffing conditions, um, have been worse than they ever have been. It's even worse than before COVID, it seems like. Um, the manda- mandatory overtime um, is really affecting the nurses and the morale of the hospital. So that's interesting that you think it's worse than before um, or during COVID. Why is that? Did you lose people from burnout? Why is that? Well, it seemed like for COVID, you would you had like helping hands to come to the floor. Because at the time during COVID, we weren't doing elective surgeries. Um, There were, you know, very few colonoscopies, actually none, endoscopies. So that staff would float up to the unit and to the floors to help out with the patients. We don't even have that now. So what so what happens with mandatory overtime? I mean, how does that work? Uh, sounds like you don't have an option not to work just by the, the term mandatory overtime. Is that the case? Well, they will come to you and or call um, like 20 minutes before the end of your shift. And, you know, say, does anybody want to stay? Most of the time, nobody really wants to stay. We've already worked eight, 12 hours short. Um, and we'll say, no, nobody wants to stay. So then they'll say, well, then I'm going to mandate you. So you're almost like forced into that. There are people that have been mandated two days in a row. even. And so what kind of shifts are we talking about? What's a, is there a typical shift in nursing? Like how many hours? Well, so we all, it's a variety. We do, well, the shifts are either eight hours or 12 hours. We do 12 hours in the in intensive care. And that's where you work? Yes. There is a nurse that works out on the floor. Her shift is three in the morning till three in the afternoon. They mandated her to stay till 7 p. So that would be two full shifts. And then she was supposed to come back at 3 a.m. So she's only had not even eight hours off. By the time you get home, you get settled. It's not even a break, really, an eight-hour break in between getting off of your shift and needing to return. So obviously, that's got to be a concern with trying to just do your job properly. I mean, who can work under those kind of conditions and have a you know clear mind? And you're making life and death decisions. What is that like? Very, very unsafe. And it just seems like we try to explain them, to explain that to management. We have nurses that will volunteer, have actually, I can think of one in particular, she's got three young children, um, and she started coming to work three in the morning to 11 in the morning because her husband had to get to work and they didn't have a sitter. They mandated her another eight hours. So she ended up working 16 hours. She was there till seven um, at night, three to 11 and 11 to seven. So seven P. And then she was expected again to come back in at 3 a.m. Wow. And And you know what? You make a good point that I think a lot of people don't think of that I wasn't thinking of. First, you think of the intense work that you do as an RN, But then you forget that people have families to go home to who also need them, like in her case, children, Mm -hmm. husband, you know, people dependent upon you. And you're just exhausted, I'm sure. Yeah. And, you know, I really think the employees at that hospital are, you know, they are dedicated and we are beginning to feel, well, not beginning, uh, we have been feeling not valued. 
uh, disrespected. And that hurts. And that's not how you want to make your dedicated employees feel. Because I've said it before, and I will say it a million times more. The best way to take care of your patients is to take care of your staff. I wanted to um, wrap up with th- your thoughts on the legislation. Allison, what, t- talk to me a little bit about what difference, what kind of a difference this legislation being passed could make. Well, it will absolutely stop the abuse of this mandation law. Um, you got to think about the nurses coming up, you know, and the, the future nurses. Uh, we have a uh, college here in town, um, Cuyuga Community College, and the nursing students there do their clinical, some of their clinical at the hospital. Now, if you were doing your clinical at, ho- at the hospital and seeing some of the things that go on. Not a good and message. Then, and then not a good message. Absolutely. And what would your message be to um, legislators as we are trying to get them to pass this legislation? Think of your nurses. Two years ago, you were saying we were heroes, and now we are feeling uh, disrespected and unvalued. Um, And if you really, really value anyone in the healthcare, you need to pass this bill and protect the nurses and make those fines. Dick. All right, Allison. Well, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate you taking the time out to share your experiences with us. We really do appreciate it. Thanks. No, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We just heard from a couple of nurses about how dire the situation is in some hospitals across New York State because of mandatory overtime. And now I'd like to welcome to the Union Strong podcast, Michelle Krenzel, who's the political director at the New York State Nurses Association, NISNA. And she can talk to us a little bit about legislation that we're working on to try to change this and strengthen these mandatory overtime laws. So, Michelle, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Now, when we talk about NISNA, for people who don't know, you represent more than 40,000, I think around 42,000 nurses who work all across the state in the public sector, private sector. So you've got RNs, registered nurses in hospitals, dealing with this mandatory overtime. Are you hearing um, the same kind of thing, that that's a major concern among nurses right now? Yeah, so we're hearing it in different parts of the state. You know, as you mentioned, we're a statewide union. We have members all over in every region of the state, right? And so we're hearing about mandatory overtime as an issue in the Bronx. We're hearing about it in Long Island. We heard about it in Hudson Valley, right? So we're hearing it in different in different places. And I won't say that it's every employer, right? But what happens often is you'll have a few employers who we could call bad actors maybe, right? Who are taking advantage of this and exploiting nurses. And so we really want legislation that is going to put in that backstop that keeps the bad actors from really exploiting the loopholes. And so that's really what we're trying to get at here. But yes, we are hearing it in different parts of the state. Does it concern you just with the profession in general? I mean, these nurses went through a lot, Uh, all of our essential and frontline workers did during the pandemic. Um, but nurses in particular, so they're coming off of this now, and then they're having to work this mandatory overtime exhausted. Um, I mean, are you seeing burnout? And do you do you worry about the profession attracting new people and keeping those experienced and skilled professionals in that profession? Definitely. Um, I think that's a major concern. We're worried about recruitment and retention, right? We want to keep the nurses we have, especially the experienced nurses who are really going to be training the new nurses that we're trying to recruit. If we don't have those experienced nurses, you will have new nurses come in, they won't feel supported, and they'll leave. Right. And so we wouldn't have even recruited enough people. We'll just keep seeing massive turnover. So that's a big concern for us because when we hear about the shortage of nurses and you hear about this shortage all the time, people are talking about the shortage of nurses. You know, I challenge people to think that there's a shortage of nurses willing to work in really poor working conditions. That's a shortage that we're not actually talking about. There are a lot of nurses who are licensed in the state who have left the bedside. They're not working at the bedside. They're keeping up with their license. So they haven't completely turned their back on the profession, but I think they're not wanting to come back to such poor working conditions, especially after they went through so much, dedicating themselves, sacrificing 
you know, their selves, their family time, all sorts of things just to take care of, you know, take care of New Yorkers, which is what they want to do. They want to take care of people in this state. But when the working conditions make it hard for them to do that, that's when people want to leave. So let's talk about the emergency exemption. I mean, we've had mandatory overtime uh, laws on the books, I think, since 2008, so for quite a while. So now right. we need to take a look back at the um, emergency exemption. And we can all agree the pandemic's an emergency. Okay, so you have to mandatory uh, overtime with the nurses. But if that's not the case now, uh, what would this legislation do to um, make this a little bit more under control and not, and not you know, abused? No, for sure. I mean, I think what this legislation does is try to correct those loopholes, right? So when we say that there's an emergency, how long is that emergency, right? There's, I hate to say, but there's different levels, right? You see emergency stratified, especially when you have sort of an issue like this that's going to be protracted over years, right? When we first got hit in April or March of 2020, that looks different than it does right now. But we can still say we are in an emergency situation with COVID, but different situations. So nurses knew what was happening in March and April. I mean, there was a lot they didn't know, but they knew they were up to the task at least of, you know, we're going in, we're going to do the best that we can under some really terrible circumstances to try and save as many people as we possibly can. And they did that, right? We saw them do that. Now we have a different situation. We know a lot more about COVID. We're managing it um, to an extent. Um, mandating overtime the way that they did in, you know, 2020 or even in the other surges last year, as they're doing today, that's just not fair, right? But people can do that because they can abuse sort of this emergency loophole, right? If there's a declared emergency, then this law can be suspended. What this would actually do is fix that, right? Where it would actually put time limits on what these emergent situations are so people can adjust their staffing because that's what happens, right? If something happens, you start to adjust the staffing to make sure that you're actually um, dealing with the situation at hand. But if you just say that this is an emergency, you know, for the foreseeable future and we're going to mandate you for the foreseeable future, people aren't going to buy that and people are going to get frustrated and they're going to get angry and burned out. Michelle Krenzel, the political director at NISNA, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Helen Schaub is joining me now on the podcast, and she is the interim political director for 1199 SEIU. Helen, thanks for joining me on the program. Thank you so much for having me. So can you talk specifically about this piece of legislation? I mean, there's a couple of pieces out there, but the one piece that addresses mandatory overtime when, it, when we talk about enforcement, because it's great that we've got mandatory overtime laws on the books, which we've had for years, but now we need to make sure that employers are adhering to the law, essentially. And, and would, is that what this legislation would do? Exactly. So we've run into a problem, which I know you've discussed before, that uh, there is an exemption for emergency situations, that the law is not in effect. And that was really intended to be for, you know, there's a hurricane, there's a snowstorm, people can't get into work, and potentially you would have to mandate people already in the hospital to stay in order to make sure that you had, uh, you know, coverage for the patient care. Um, that unfortunately has meant that the law has been suspended for the last two years um, because of the COVID state of emergency. So as I know we've discussed, this narrows that to say, no, no, we're talking about really true, acute, you know, short-term emergencies. Um, and then the second thing that it does, um, so one is make sure the law gets into effect, um, but then strengthens penalties for, uh, for violating the law. Uh, even prior to the COVID emergency, when the law was in effect, some hospitals just routinely violated it. You know, our experience has been, it's not been every hospital. Most hospitals understand that actually in order to, uh, you know, have a workforce that's not exhausted, et cetera, one, you need to staff sufficiently, but two, um, if you do need people to work overtime, you ought to incentivize them to do that. Um, you know, if it's offering double time or something like that. So people can volunteer for, you know, if they feel like they're able to take on an additional shift. That's obviously very different than just telling someone who's exhausted at the end of their shift, oh, I'm sorry, you have to stay um, another, you know, three hours or eight hours, whatever the case may be. And some hospitals just do not staff appropriately. And so they're often in a situation where they're, uh, they're mandating people. And, and uh, we want to make sure that 
uh, those hospitals are held accountable and that there are stronger penalties for violating the law. And so what are the penalties? So uh, there's two bills that propose uh, penalties. Um, so the, what uh, uh, what the main bill does is start out with a you know civil penalty of $1,000 for a first violation, $2,500 for a second violation within three years, and $5,000 for a third or subsequent violation within three years. Um, and that, that uh, nurses get an additional 15% uh, of the overtime payment from the employers for each violation. So, you know, our understanding is that this would be for each nurse. Uh, so if you're on a shift mandating several nurses, they would have to pay the penalty for each nurse. And it obviously escalates uh, when uh, the empo- employer repeatedly violates it. So what do you say to people who, I mean, this is all too true. Uh, this also is to focus on patient safety. I mean, you don't want people exhausted, like you mentioned, and having to be mandated when they're, maybe they're worried about taking care of their family or wherever it is they have to go after work to have to stay there at work. So what do you say to people then who are concerned that by strengthening these mandatory overtime laws, it is going to be an issue about patient safety? Because if you can't tell people they have to stay, how does that gap get filled of not having the people to do the work? Again, uh, you know, this clearly covers emergency situations. There's a school bus crash. All of a sudden you need a lot more, uh, you know, personnel in the hospital to deal with incoming folks. You know, you can mandate people to work if you need to do that in order to respond to an emergency situation that you could not have anticipated. But what this does is make sure that for situations that the employer can participate for, you can anticipate for uh, routine staffing needs. They know that they've approved X number of vacations. So they need, they know in advance that they need to uh, backfill those folks that are going to be out on vacation. That should not be a situation in which they mandate people. They know that they're going to need to fill those shifts and they ought to fill them with, you know, making sure that they have sufficient nurses on staff, number one, and um, being incentivized to actually uh, recruit and retain nurses. Then if they need to, you know, use agencies for particular coverage when, you know, you have a lot of people out on vacation or something like that. And then finally, by incentivizing people to voluntarily choose to work overtime. All of those things they can do, there are tools in their toolbox that they ought to be using. And we want to make sure that they do that first before they resort to mandation and that they never should be mandating for, uh, for routine staffing needs. Well, Helen, we appreciate your time and going through this with us. Um, you know, we're New York State AFL-CIO is trying to lift up these pieces of legislation. I know you guys have been out there um, talking to anyone and everyone who will listen. Um, any piece of advice on our listeners, what they can do to help uh, try to get these across the finish line? We've only got a couple days left of the session. Absolutely. Well, we certainly encourage everyone to contact their assembly member and their senator. You know, we've gotten a lot of support for this legislation. It's very uh, common sense, uh, making sure that an emergency is treated really as an emergency and not um, as something that uh, could be anticipated and making sure that the employers who routinely violate these laws are held accountable. So we've gotten a lot of support from the legislature, but any word to encourage them to make sure they pass them before the uh, end of the session would be much appreciated. All right, great. Well, Helen Schaub, thank you very much uh, from 1199 SEIU. We appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Joining me now on the podcast is our campaigns and communications coordinator, Liz Sutton. Hi, Liz. Hi, Darcy. So there was a lot of information there, once again, from everyone, and some really compelling and uh, passionate stories from uh, the nurses, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, these nurses have been you know, we only heard from two just now, but um, these nurses have been very active. They've uh, their petitions going around. There is a push on social media. There was recently a um, press conference. Right. So there's a really a lot of activity going on around this, trying to get it get it done within the last few days of session here. Right. They feel strongly about it, and we just want to point out to people. So we talked about two of the bills that we're supporting. There is actually a third bill on mandatory overtime, and this one is for home care nurses. And um, when they did the initial um, ban on mandatory overtime, they were left out. So this would correct that inequity, and we want people to uh, be able to get behind that bill as well. And if people are interested in the bill numbers, where can they get that information? Yeah, Darcy, that's right. Uh, We are going to have the bill numbers in our show notes, um, uh, both for the uh, audio and the video versions of uh, the podcast. So we'll make sure to have that information there. Okay, great. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Darcy. 
This has been a production of the New York State AFL-CIO. Our president is Mario Salento. Our secretary treasurer is Terry Melvin. We're a federation of 3,000 unions representing 2.5 million union members, retirees, and their families with one goal, to raise the standard of living and quality of life of all working people. We keep New York State Union strong by fighting for better wages, better benefits, and better working conditions. For more information on the labor movement in New York, visit nysaflcio.org. Until next time, stay union and stay strong.